Good evening. Welcome to this semester's final installment of From the Faculty Lounge. Tonight, we consider the different ways that senses, specifically smell and taste, impact a large array of behaviors and processes. Let me tell you a little bit more about our wonderful speakers this evening. With a deep interest in answering the question of what it is like to be a dog, Professor Horowitz's research focuses on the olfactory experience of the domestic dog to better understand their abilities, which she believes could lead to stronger dog-human relationships. Through her research, she has also begun testing the effects of improving her own sense of smell and its effect on her daily life. Professor Horowitz is the author of several books, including two New York Times bestsellers, Inside of a Dog, What Dogs See, Smell, and Know, and the second, Being a Dog, Following the Dog into the World of Smell. Professor Glenn Denning studies the physiology and the mechanisms that control feeding in animals. With recent publications in Physiology and Behavior, the American Journal of Physiology and Chemical Senses, among others. Glenn Denning is interested in why we like some foods and dislike others, and studies the physiological mechanisms that mediate our reactions to foods, which can be influenced by both genetics and by dietary experience. Recently, Glenn Denning has become interested in how multiple sensory systems contribute to the flavor of foods, and beverages. So let me begin, if I may, uh, Professor Horowitz, with asking you uh, a simple question. What led you to become interested and involved in the field of dog cognition? This is a relatively new academic field. What was it? Um, in fact, there was no field of dog cognition when I began studying dogs. Um, instead, I was in a cognitive science program, and I was interested, and I still am, in how we can make statements about the minds of nonverbal others, basically non-human animals who can't tell us what they know. Um, and I got interested in play behavior as a good context in which to uh, examine what animals were doing, and then maybe what they might be knowing. Um, as it turns out, if you're looking for a playing species, Dogs turn out to be the terrific species. You know, they're playing all the time. They play into adulthood. Um, I was taking, I lived with a dog, and I took her out three times a day to play while I was searching for a species to study, and I finally found it right in front of me. Um, I wound up studying play in dogs with an interest in their minds, and then right at that time, there began to be an interest in studying the cognitive abilities of dogs um, more internationally. Research groups began to study dogs as they had studied non-human primates, looking at comparative abilities. And so right at that moment, um, given the interest that the dog presented to me, uh, I decided to study just the dog, not the theoretical construct of uh, play and what that might say about mind. Um, instead, looking and examining the dog. Very interesting. Professor Glenn Denning, tell us a little bit about your own research trajectory and how you became interested in the relationship between taste and behavior. Well, I, uh, I spent a year in Japan during college, and uh, I was fairly finicky before I went to Japan. A lot of things I didn't like to eat, kind of like my son I was telling me about earlier. Mm. And I went to Japan and ate everything in Japan. I mean, nothing goes to waste. Um, I was in a very rural part of Japan, ate insects, which was a little bit shocking to me. But what I found interesting was that the way they prepared it, they, they, uh, they used sort of a teriyaki sauce on a grasshopper. And it, it turns out to be quite delicious. I think if my mother had fed it to me, I never would have touched it. <laughs> but in the context of that very rural 
environment in what they call the Japan Alps. And given all the flavors I had, it just made sense. And I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, since then, if you think back to when, when you were in college, the American diet was very simple. I mean, we didn't have many spices. There weren't many fresh vegetables. You know, the supermarket, there's just a couple foods. But now, you know, the supermarket's incredible. There's fresh spices. There's foods from all over the world. <laughs> but we love spices. And it turns out that spices are very adaptive. You know, when you start, people have been looking at this. A guy named Paul Sherman discovered that many of the spices that we eat have antibacterial properties. And humans are one of the only species that consume spices. And we might have evolved this attraction to spices because before refrigeration, food was always rotting. And so by adding capsaicin, garlic, onions, basil, oregano, all these things would have helped sterilize the poorly preserved food that humans used to eat. And so, so, so anyway, it was, it was sort of in that environment that I just developed this real interest in food and spices and, and how experience changes the way we respond to foods. John, I know you also studied dogs as an undergrad. Right. So I wonder if that led, that would have been, it was livestock guarding dogs, right? Right. So, and so there you're looking at not the molecular system, but the whole body system. I wonder if that influenced your approach in biology subsequently at all. I mean, I, I initially was inter interested in um, behavior in a general sense. And here you had this remarkable case where you have dogs that have been selected for hundreds of generations by Europeans to protect sheep against wolves and human thieves. And, and Darwin actually talked about these livestock guardian dogs. He never understood how you got, in effect, a wolf to protect the sheep against other wolves. And, uh, and what Darwin discovered is they, they raised the, these dogs on, uh, on sheep's milk. So they had early exposure. But still, talk about play behavior. These dogs had very poor interspecies discriminating abilities, and they, I think they thought sheep were dogs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they play with, each, with the sheep? They played with the sheep. They even tried to mate the sheep. I mean, they, they, they didn't have a clue, you know, uh, that these sheep weren't other dogs. That, that was an early interest of mine, but uh, it was really during my doctoral and postdoctoral work that I kind of shifted to this interest in taste. Mm. What about uh, sugar? Sugar. Ah, sugar. We all love sugar. And human craving for sugar. Tell, right. tell us more. Dogs about... love sugar. That's true. But right. the interesting thing is cats don't. Cats can't taste sugar. If you're to give cats uh, a, a solution that has 30% sucrose in it and give them water, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They don't have the receptors they for it? They don't have the receptors for it. But dogs certainly do. Yeah. Dogs love sweets. Um, humans, That's why we have a lot of obese dogs, as a matter of fact. Exactly. Yeah, yeah they, they put a lot of sugar in their, in their foods. Yeah. Um, sugar certainly motivates us to eat a lot of things. There's a famous experiment where they put these rats inside this warm box, and they, they created this, these tunnels made out of like aluminum in this freezing room that was below zero. And the rat had to walk like 200 feet through this freezing cold pipe in order to get to the sugar solution. And it did it all day long. It didn't care. It will do, it'll go through any sort of, any sort of challenge uh, in order to get sugar. I think humans are like that too. It turns out that we have taste receptors in our mouth which enable us to sense sugar, but we have the same receptors in our gut. And they also respond to sugar. And there are some new receptors we've been discovering. And what we think is going on is it actually isn't the, the oral taste that drives us to eat sugar so much. We think that once the sugar gets in our gut and it starts being absorbed, there's, there's a sensing device there. And it's unconscious, but it, it strongly motivates us to return and have more sugar. Mm -hmm. And, and that may be much more important than the sweet taste in causing us to have that second cookie or that second dessert. <laughs> Professor Harvowitz, why, switching gears a little bit, why is it important to know or discover what dogs smell, what they see, what they know? <coughs> I think dogs wind up being a really interesting subject. And for many years, as I say, they weren't studied, maybe because they're domesticated, 
They're not exotic. We don't expect them to have any of the special abilities that non-human primates might have. But they turn out to be interesting because, exactly because of their ubiquitousness, right, and their familiarity. So there are some 80 million dogs or so in the US. They're really? in our homes. They're perhaps in your beds, right? And yet, there hasn't been a lot of cognitive research about what their experience is. Um, instead, we tend to use a pretty complete vocabulary of anthropomorphisms, just attributions that we make to dogs, treating them as though they are like little furry people, right? And within a week of living with a dog, many owners have pretty fully formed statements that they will make about what their dogs know, the grudges they're holding, you know, what they want, <laughs> their preferences and dislikes. Not because they've been studying the dog, but because that's a natural human behavior to, with, to try to predict another organism's behavior. We make attributions to them. And so we've done this to the dog, and I got very interested in trying to unpack some of these attributions that we've made to dogs. If we're gonna have an understanding of this animal in our home, we have to know what their cognitive abilities are and also what their sensory abilities are because they, like most non-primates, have very different sensory abilities than humans. And that means that just their ordinary experience in a room is not as shared with us as we'd like to think. You know, it, for all of us in this room, we. It's, it's a familiar and ordinary scene, a visual scene. But for dogs and many other mammals who are primarily olfactory, it isn't probably a visual scene. You know, It's an olfactory scene. And then if you start thinking about what an olfactory scene is, um, then you realize it, that's when it gets kind of interesting and complicated. And you realize that, that the animal sitting beside you who seems to be conspiring with you and in it together with you might really be having quite a different experience than you think. So my research is, is based in that interest in saying, well, can we start to understand? We want to do right by these animals who live with us. So can we start to understand the world from their point of view? And that includes their sensory point of view. Hmm. So I, you know, I always think when I come home that you know, my wife will say, do you have a good day? I'll say, oh, yeah, and I'll talk about some, something that happened. But my dog, meanwhile, is smelling me. Sure. And, and the dog knows exactly what I ate. Yeah. It, it can tell all the meals. It, it can smell all the people, probably, yes. or most yes. of them that I spoke with. I mean, there's right. really there's no secrets. <laughs> and, and you know, my wife thinks, oh, I didn't do too much. I just sat so on the desk all day. So you're keeping secrets there. <laughs> <laughs> and the dog's like, hmm, who is that I smell? You know, there's, there's just there's, there's this whole... There's like a novel written on the outside of my body about my whole day. Right, absolutely. Which they perceive, and, yeah. and humans are like oblivious to that. Yeah, we mostly don't smell each other, <laughs> right? right? right. Except for mostly. accidentally. No, I started smelling my friends. Right. But to see what that's like, because we all have a smell, right? right? Whether even the very clean among us, right? It's not that you're clean or not. It's that we get accustomed to our own odor, but every object in the world basically has a smell. If the molecules can be volatile and rise to our nose, we have the potential, potential to smell it. Right, so we're leaving traces on, when we shake someone's hand, we're leaving a trace of ourself and our smell on that hand, and your dog then will know about that later on. So I think that's, that is fascinating. They're kind of knowing what happened in the past, looking at you in the present, or smelling you in the present. Right. I think once you start looking at smells as just information, as I think a dog must do. In other right. words, just what the scene is, just right. who's been there or who's coming around the corner, rather right. than just good or bad, we view them as very binary. Mm -hmm. Then, right, the smell of a person is just identifying of that person. That's certainly what dogs are doing when they're smelling each other, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking partially for the signature odor of other dogs. Who is that dog? I can see who they are, but I'll really know who they are when I can smell them. Mm -hmm. There are cultures, and ours is not one, where smell is used quite profoundly, and they're mostly hunter-gatherer cultures right. at this point. And in fact, those cultures have um, smell vocabulary, which is quite rich. Right. Almost, almost we're, we don't have any correlates of red or, or green or blue for smell, right? We talk about something smells like its source, so that smells well, like I, coffee. I, there is an exception. You listen to these sommeliers, and they seem very pretentious at times. But the reality is, is they've developed 
an incredibly rich uh, vocabulary for odors. That's true, but it's a still all referen referencing a source. So that's right. like, that's a leather, or that's a smoke, right. or that's a rubber, or that's right. a citrus, right? So it's all right. about the source, but right. these hunter-gatherer tribes have words to describe, you know, one word might, these are Malayan um, communities, have words to describe some mushrooms and rotting things and going on a hunt. Mm -hmm. You know, the, all those things have a certain characteristic smell to them. Mm -hmm. So I think partially our, our experience with smell is a result of our culture and wanting to deodorize. We right. really value smell, having no smell in the right. subway car right. or the exactly. bus, right? right? Most people would prefer that car. Right. So uh, it's an interesting phenomenon where I'm kind of celebrating smell not because I love all smells, but because I feel like it's a, it's a part of our rich experience. And there's certainly a part of the dog's sensory experience. Our culture is trying to, to reduce smells altogether. I started training my own nose a little bit to try to improve my own olfactory awareness. And it is the case that I became less um, judgmental, I guess, about smells. Um, I went on smell walks where you're you know, you're running up to the bill side of the building and smelling the building or smelling over a trash can and seeing, and right. then you're just finding out what the smell is. And I think the difference is, in those cases, when you're investigating a smell, you're happening to it. You know, you're intentionally uh, bringing a smell to your nose and controlling right. that experience versus what most of our experience is, especially in New York, is smells happen to us. And we don't want to, them to happen to us. And so then, they hit us and they might be good, but they're often bad. So that, but that shift, then think about the dog who is always in, you know, intentionally investigating smells. I don't think the dog is having a binary, that's a good or bad smell right. experience. They're having a, that's the world. That's right. what and, the world is. And they're experience. learning from what they smell. Absolutely. I mean, and smell is in your work as well. As someone who studies taste, you are secondarily also studying smell. Oh, not? primarily. People confuse taste and smell and a third sensation called trigeminal sensation. So taste is like sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami. Odor is what we experience when we like put a rose in front of our nose, and inhale it. And trigeminal sensation is uh, things like chili pepper burn, temperature, the, the, the mouth feel of foods like the difference between a soggy and a crisp potato chip. Um, and, and so all of these, these things conspire to create flavor. But what people don't realize is that when you introduce food into your mouth, you can still smell it because the odors enter as you're exhaling, they enter into the back of your nose in what's called retronasal olfaction. But the curious thing is your brain then takes the odor you experience as it enters in exclusively from the back of your nose, and you perceive it as coming from your mouth. So a lot of people will say, if they have a cold and their, their, their nose is clogged, that food doesn't taste as good. It turns out that that has nothing to do with taste. They've lost their sense of olfaction. So it's very difficult to determine what's taste, smell, or olfaction. Um, but to get back to dogs, I think that this segues into a nice topic, which is, I don't know how many of you have dogs, but basically, you know, if, if I was to offer a dog something, it, it, it smells it, and then it's in its mouth for about a nanosecond, right? It just swallows it right down. So it's done all of its evaluation by what we call orthonasal olfaction, by inhaling the odor through its nose. Humans and sommeliers have this sublime ability to evaluate the odor of foods through retronasal olfaction. And why retronasal olfaction is so much more interesting is because it occurs together with taste and this trigeminal sensation. So you talk about a wine. It has a smell. It has that astringent, like a nice Cabernet. It kind of has that drying sensation in your mouth. Or you have like a soda with some carbonation in it. So you're getting the carbonation. You're getting the temperature. You're getting the sweet taste. You're getting the aroma. Let's say if it's, a, if it's a, some sort of fruity, carbonated fruit juice. And all of those together create this sublime sensation. So it's not taste, it's not smell, it's not trigeminal sensation. It's all of those together. And, and it, it, it's really a remarkable thing. And dogs don't seem to experience that. Yeah, we don't know exactly what the subjective experience is of, of the dog gulping down the food. But we have to but assume it's, from that lack it, it, of time it spends in the mouth 
that they are not experiencing that retronasal they're, they're olfaction. They're not savoring the it. The flavor yeah. that we linger on, right? That they have done their evaluation and maybe even their appreciation of it in that first sniffing bout when they decide to put it in their mouth or not. I mean, think of a dog. It gets to a vertical object on the street. I mean, my dog could smell that post for like 20 minutes. I mean, yes. again, I think there's a novel written on that post. I, I just can't imagine what makes it so interesting, but it is. And, and I think they're savoring well, the smell. Well, what makes it interesting to look at a painting yeah, right. for 20 minutes, Well, I, right? I, I, I think that's what it's like, but, but yeah. I, think they're, I think they savor things through smell, whereas when we put foods in our mouth, they're like, oh, that chocolate, it just feels so good. You, just wanna, you never want to swallow it. You just want to keep it in there and, and experience those sublime and sensations. And, uh, and dogs don't do that. Yeah. And most animals don't. And I think that what's interesting there is that this is sort of evidence, this retronasal root, that we actually have quite good sense of smell. Right. In fact, human neuroscientists who I talk to, olfactory neuroscientists, are always complaining to me, you know, like, yeah, I don't think the dog's sense of smell is so great. I mean, we have a great sense of smell, and the evidence is basically that we taste food so magnificently, that that's a big part <laughs> of our experience, because that's using the same olfactory receptor cells as sniffing through our nostrils mm -hmm. would. So um, you, Alex, Alessandra, prefer, perform your research in Barnard's dog cognition. Right, right. yeah. So what exactly is it that you do in that space? What are you measuring? What are you so this is not where I'm doing my own smelling investigation, but I do have a dog cognition lab here at Barn Barnard. And it, um, I began it in 2008. I think it was the first lab um, studying dog cognition in the States. and. I had students, uh, I was teaching an animal behavior class, who wanted to study dogs with me. Mm. And I thought, oh, well, uh, okay, you know, let's like <laughs> make a group of you and we'll all go perform these tasks together. And of course, you can do a lot more experimentally when you have a lot of different participants. Um, and since then, I've done a range of experiments where we're, we're mostly studying dogs. We study dogs in simple forced choice tests to see what they're distinguishing. We study dogs in the dog parks. Um, we've, we've studied dog-human play behavior. We've studied what they're sniffing on those, when they sniff the post in the park for you know, other dogs you're in. Um, and we've also studied humans, uh, people's reaction to images of dogs, because I'm very interested also in, in this anthropomorphizing and why we seem to say all these things about what dogs know and understand, but we're not doing the same type of thing toward other animals in some cases. You know? uh, so eels are very rarely anthropomorphized. You never hear people talking about the, like that really cute eel who had such, you know, who really loves me. Or any, we don't say that. And so what is it about dogs um, that, especially if their physical features, and even alone, their physical features, that makes them anthropomorphizable kind of. So we've even done studies like that. And, and students are involved in all levels of that. You know, they serve as experimenter, they learn to code behavior, um, dog behavior, uh, you know, they recruit subjects and so forth. So uh, Professor Horowitz has talked about her quest for smell, to reform her own sense of smell. How about you and taste? How has your study of taste affected what you eat or what you cook? Well, so, so I, I now study, uh, I'm interested in this, in flavor. So smell, taste, and trigeminal integration. And, um, <clears throat> and so what's created that interest is just all of the amazing foods and that the, the, the diverse types of foods that are available to us. And so, yeah, so now I can go to a restaurant and you can start, start breaking down all the different sensory contributions to a food. And you know, people like foods generally that are very complex. You know, chefs will talk about this, it's a complex wine, or it's a very complex flavor that's in this stir fry. And um, you start realizing that what you're doing is causing, these chefs have learned how to cause, like, to massively stimulate almost every sensory system in your mouth. And the more sensory modalities they activate, the more humans generally like the food. So I, I want to thank you, and thank you. It was a very interesting conversation. I enjoyed being in the middle of it, literally. <laughs> What is the single most important takeaway from your research? Mm. You want to start? Sure. Um, I can be short. Mm -hmm. Let dogs smell the world. Mm. That is their primary sensory experience. And 
uh, and if you're brave, smell after them because it's uh, an ability that we have, a kind of latent ability mm -hmm. that we're not using. So mine would be just to seek sensory novelty when you travel. Don't try to find the American foods. <laughs> so a lot of people do. try to just find what the locals eat, but be careful. Because sometimes what they eat is really hot. Uh, but, but just try to embrace the, the cultural diversity that people have created in food and just all the spice combinations. You know, so, so anyway, just when you travel, really try to explore what the locals eat. And I think you'll have a better trip. Thank you.